Welcome to Amazing Life One Channel Guides Today you watching Jean Shrimpton English model actress lifestyle biography and beautiful photos I hope you enjoy this video like share subscribe channel thank you for watching video your favorite actress model singer celebrity biography photos images if you want to see please comment. Starting. Full name Jean Shrimpton. Net worth 1.5 million dollars. Date of birth November 7, 1942. Place of birth High Wycombe, Buckinghamshire, England, UK. Height 1.7 meters. Occupation fashion model, actress, hotel owner, innkeeper, antique shop owner, antique dealer. Profession actor, supermodel, fashion model. Education St. Bernard's Catholic Grammar School Jean Rosemary Shrimpton, born 7 November 1942, is an English model and actress. She was an icon of swinging London and is considered to be one of the world's first supermodels. She appeared on numerous magazine covers including Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, Vanity Fair, Glamour, Elle, Late Is Home Journal, Newsweek, and Time. In 2009, Harper's Bazaar named Shrimpton one of the 26 best models of all time, and in 2012, Time named her one of the 100 most influential fashion icons of all time. She starred alongside Paul Jones in the film Privilege, 1967. Early Life Born in High Wycombe, Buckinghamshire, and brought up on a farm, Shrimpton was educated at St. Bernard's Convent School, SLU. She enrolled at Langham Secretarial College in London when she was 17. A chance meeting with director Cy Enfield led to an unsuccessful meeting with the producer of his film Mysterious Island, 1961. Enfield then suggested she attend the Lucy Clayton Charm Academy's model course. In 1960, aged 17, she began modeling, appearing on the covers of popular magazines such as Harper's Bazaar, Vanity Fair, and Vogue. Career Shrimpton's career rose to prominence through her work with photographer David Bailey. They met in 1960 at a photo shoot that Shrimpton, who was then an unknown model, was working on with photographer Brian Duffy for a Kellogg's Corn Flakes advertisement. Duffy told Bailey she was too posh for him, but Bailey was undeterred. Shrimpton's first photo session with Bailey was in 1960 either for Condé Nast's Brides on 7 December 1960 or for British Vogue. She started to become known in the modeling world around the time she was working with Bailey. Shrimpton has stated she owed Bailey her career, and he is often credited for discovering her and being influential in her career. In turn, she was Bailey's muse, and his photographs of her helped him rise to prominence in his early career. During her career, Shrimpton was widely reported to be the world's highest paid model, the most famous model, and the most photographed in the world. She was also described as having the world's most beautiful face, and as the most beautiful girl in the world. She was dubbed, the it girl, the face, the face of the moment, and, the face of the 60s. Glamour named her, model of the year, in June 1963. She contrasted with the aristocratic looking models of the 1950s by representing the cultish, gamine look of the youthquake movement in 1960s swinging London, and she was reported as, the symbol of swinging London. Breaking the popular mold of voluptuous figures with her long legs and slim figure, she was nicknamed, the shrimp. Shrimpton was also known for her long hair with a fringe, wide doe eyes, long wispy eyelashes, arched brows, and pouty lips. Shrimpton also helped launch the miniskirt. In 1965, she made a two-week promotional visit to Australia, sponsored by the Victoria Racing Club, and a local synthetic fiber company who brought her out to promote a range of new dresses made of Orland. She was paid a fee of £2,000, an enormous sum at the time. She caused a sensation in Melbourne when she arrived for the Victoria Derby wearing a white shift dress made by Colin Rolfe which ended 5 in 13 centimeters above her knees. She wore no hat, stockings or gloves, and sported a man's watch, which was unusual at the time. Shrimpton was unaware she would cause such reaction in the Melbourne community and media. In her article, The Man in the Bill Blast Suit, Nora Ephron tells of the time when Jean Shrimpton posed for a Revlon advertisement in an antique white Chantilly lace dress by Blast. Minutes after the lipstick placard was displayed at the drugstores, the Revlon switchboard received many calls from women demanding to know where they could buy the dress. Shrimpton was photographed in 1971 by Clive Aerosmith, again for British Vogue. Personal Life Shrimpton and Bailey began dating soon after they began working together, 
and subsequently had a four-year relationship that ended in 1964. Bailey was still married to his first wife Rosemary Bramble when the affair began, but left her after nine months and later divorced her to be with Shrimpton. Shrimpton's other most celebrated romance was with actor Terence Stamp. In 1979, she married photographer Michael Cox at the register office in Penzance, Cornwall when she was four months pregnant with their son Thaddeus, who was born that same year. They own the Abbey Hotel in Penzance, now managed by Thaddeus and his family. In the media, Shrimpton is name-checked as, Jeannie Shrimpton, in the Smithereens song, Behind the Wall of Sleep, 1986. The story of Shrimpton's relationship with David Bailey is dramatized in a BBC4 film, We'll Take Manhattan, the 26th of January 2012 with Karen Gillan playing the part of Shrimpton. The most beautiful of all the models I have known was Jean Shrimpton. To walk down the King's Road, Chelsea with Shrimpton was like walking through the rye. Strong men just keeled over right and left as she strode up the street. Shrimpton herself seemed to have no awareness of her extraordinary looks, Mary Quant where do you start with a face as famous as Jean Shrimpton's? It could be her relationship with David Bailey, which brought a fresh new look into fashion photography, or there's the pictures of her simply sizzling with Terence Stamp. There's the 1990 Jean Shrimpton biography, only written, she told The Guardian in 2011, because she needed money to renovate the roof of the hotel she now owns. The Abbey Hotel in Penzance there's been plenty of mythologizing about her contribution to fashion but look at any Jean Shrimpton photos and she still appears every bit as gorgeous and modern as she would have done in the 1960s. Ask me, or the girl next to me, who we wouldn't mind looking like in the shrimp will feature pretty highly. No wonder, coming after the groomed hauteur of Dorian Lee and Barbara Golan and the like, her looks seemed like a breath of fresh air. And this became her selling point. Her adverts for Tricell, reproduced in vogue throughout 1964, are peppered with slogans like, look wonderful in your own way, and girls are looking like girls again, while Harper's Bazaar, September 1965, boldly proclaims, this woman is you, I wish. David Bailey himself expresses it well in Model Girl, where he's quoted as saying, I think the thing about Jean was that she wasn't the stiff, dummy kind of posed shop window mannequin. She was somebody you felt you could have touched, almost, Jean's look was what every girl wanted to look like. It was through her relationship with David Bailey in the 1960s that her stunning looks became something other than simply pretty. For Bailey, she was one part of a wider vision, actually the caricature of what I wanted to make girls look like. Kennedy Fraser, typically eloquently, describes how their imagery, suggested links to anti-establishment elements that had not yet infiltrated the elite precincts of couture. As a famous couple who were clearly having sex with each other, and an unmarried couple at that well, to each other, Bailey was married to someone else they chipped away at both the image of the mannequin and what was deemed appropriate behavior for young ladies of the period after Bailey, Shrimpton famously dated the actor Terence Stamp. While together they seemed the most dazzling couple, I remember staring at this photo of them reproduced in ready, steady, go for hours in admiration of their beauty, it wasn't a happy relationship. She describes it in harsh terms in her biography, in London, my life with him was empty, I was bored, and we must have been exceedingly boring to others, we were so vain that we continued to dress ourselves up and go out to be looked at. And not just boring, but destructive too. On finding out about Shrimpton's role in the privileged film, Stamp was quoted in the national press as saying, Jean announcing she was playing a lead in a film would be like me announcing that I'm going to perform a rather complicated brain surgery tomorrow. In contrast to her relationship with Bailey, who remains a friend, Shrimpton cut all contact with Stamp after their breakup. In an interview with the Evening Standard magazine from only last month, he's quoted as calling her the love of this life, and I kind of knew it at the time, but I was driven. It was my fault. She didn't leave me for no reason. She left me because she saw I was a lunatic. I wasn't ready for a twin soul relationship. Strangely, considering the showy nature of her relationship with Stan, Shrimpton genuinely seems to hate attention, even taking her knitting with her on nights out, and is now much happier with a life out of the spotlight. In her own words she's, wayfish, cultish and cack-handed, and it was Bailey who had to teach her how to wear clothes. He agrees. In terms of personal style, Jean didn't have any. She just dressed in any old rags. Most of the time she looked like a bag lady. 
This is the girl who turned up to American Vogue in leather gear and her belongings in a plastic bag, after all. She wasn't mad on beauty products either, despite receiving £70,000, a small fortune in 1967, from Yardley to promote their ranges in the States over three years, their attempt to cash in on swinging London. In her personal appearances, she would apparently get into trouble for telling teenagers to leave their skin or hair well alone, rather than handing them a bottle of Yardley's latest product it was another awkward personal appearance which is credited to Shrimpton starting a worldwide trend, the mini. Asked to promote Orland fabrics at the Melbourne Cup, she found herself with not quite enough fabric to make a proper length dress. Oh, it doesn't matter, she apparently told her dressmaker. Make them a bit shorter, no one's going to notice. But, in then conservative Australia, when worn with no gloves, tights and hats to a prestigious event, society and the press certainly noticed and the image of her in her simple white outfit was flashed across the world. While perhaps she didn't invent the look she says that, in Britain, hemlines were beginning to creep up. Anyway, it certainly took the mini to the masses. If in person, she was never quite the supermodel people expected her to be. Behind the camera she was a pro, working with the best and for the best, achieving her self-professed, career pinnacle, of shooting with both Irving Penn and Richard of Eden. Of Eden took these pictures of Shrimpton being primped and preened at the couture shows for American Vogue in the mid-1960s. She recounts how Steve McQueen marveled at her skill during their photo shoot together, you just turn it on and off. I shrugged. It's just my job. With her husband, Michael, in her hotel, Jean Shrimpton today does finally seem to feel secure, happy and settled. Modeling was a strange career for me, she states in her autobiography. Looking back, I realized that I was never really comfortable with the fame that came with it. While her beauty is still admired and the iconic images she created with David Bailey, according to Kennedy Fraser, lie deep within each follower of fashion, she is happier with an existence outside the world of fashion. More so than ever it seems. In the Guardian interview, she says, fashion is full of dark, troubled people, she says. Only the shrewd survive, Andy Warhol, for example, and David Bailey. Of course, want to know more? You can buy a copy of Jean Shrimpton's 1964 Guide to the Fashion Industry, The Truth About Modeling from my Etsy bookstore. I'm also selling a copy of her autobiography, published in 1990.